come out of closed session. Yeah. And we are back. All right. Thank you for joining us again. Uh, we had uh, two items from closed session and checking in with Vice Chair Crandall. Was any action taken from closed session? No action taken. All right. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm just talking and there's no microphone. Let me start all over. Uh, welcome back. We had two items from closed session. Vice, C Vice Chair Crandall, was there any action taken from closed session? No action taken. All right. That felt very much like a deja vu. Um, item 6.10 or 1.30 p.m. Item presentation and update on the current status of the hydrilla eradication program activities for the Clear Lake area. We have David Cratville and Mike Metzke who would like to speak to us. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank, thank you. you for the opportunity. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Yes. Usually not a problem with my voice, but uh, um, uh, th thank you again. I'm David Cratville. I'm an environmental program manager, manager with the California Department of Food and Agriculture. Um, formerly was the supervisor overseeing the, um, uh, the uh, hydrilla eradication program. Uh, hydrilla eradication program is a statewide uh, project. Um, uh, the department gets uh, roughly $2.3 million a year to conduct survey and eradication efforts for Hydrilla verticillata is the actual plant which occurs here in uh, Clear Lake. Um, it is one of the few plants in the state named in the Food and Agriculture Code by name. Uh, the, the department is mandated um, to attempt to eradicate wherever it's feasible. And so the plant was found here. Um, I guess I should back up. I've given a presentation to the Board of Supervisors, but I, I think all, all of uh, the, the faces have changed since that time. Um, so we have a number of changes happening this year, and we just wanted to, to take the opportunity to, to, um, uh, to, to reach out to you and uh, hopefully answer any questions in case um, the, the, uh, the public uh, comes to you all with questions about what we're doing out there this year. Um, but as I was saying, so CDFA, we are mandated by uh, Food and Ag Code Section 6048 to uh, attempt eradication wherever feasible within the state. Um, Clear Lake is the largest current infestation in the state. Um, Hydrilla was found here in 1994, uh, the year I graduated high school, and this weekend I just bought my tickets to my 30-year reunion. So that tells you how, how long uh, Hydrilla has been here in this lake, um, and we've been working here in this lake ever since then. Um, we do conduct statewide or, or uh, lakewide surveys. Um, typically in April is about when we normally start. Uh, you'll see that uh, our airboats out there. Um, our airboats are specifically um, uh, marked with the CDFA logo on them. Um, I understand there's a number of other uh, pest control businesses that have airboats, um, but we, we went ahead and designated ours so that, uh, put the stickers on them so that we could um, identify ourselves. Uh, at any rate, um, we do conduct surveys most of the time on the lake um, when the boats are out there. Uh, Mike Meske, who's the supervisor of the crew here, um, he's been with us since, uh, he's moved up here in 2013 and has ran the crew ever since then. Uh, most of the time when, they, when, the, when the crews are out on the lake, they are conducting surveys and uh, you will see them throwing grappling hooks. We didn't bring one with us today. It's a small metal hook on the end of a rope and uh, we throw that into the water and, and drag it. Uh, roughly every minute we pull it up and identify any aquatic plants that are on there. Um, hydrilla is a uh, plant that roots in the sediment. Uh, it's attached to the bottom. Um, uh, as I'm sure all of you know, uh, Clear Lake can be kind of hard to see through at times. It can be can get pretty, um, pretty um, uh, turbid. Um, so we utilize those grappling hooks to to reach down into thick weed beds or uh, deep down. And then the crews, uh, there's one driver and and two crew members typically uh, throwing the hooks and doing visual surveys. So the majority of the time that our crews are out on the lake, they are doing surveys. Uh, roughly um, five to six times a year, we will do herbicide applications. Um, in recent years, our herbicide applications uh, typically take two days. Sometimes we wrap them up in one day. Uh, weather permitting, we might have to extend that to a, 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 an additional day or, or follow up the following week. But the majority of the time that our staff are out there, um, they are doing surveys. So this year, um, for the first year since uh, about 2007, um, we intend to do no treatments in Clear Lake um, for hydrilla. We have a protocol, uh, the previous protocol. So in 2002, we were treating over 1,400 acres in the lake. Um, in 2003, we found zero plants. And at that time, our protocol was to go uh, three years after the last plant find, we would pull areas out of treatment. 
Um, unfortunately, that taught us a le lesson uh, because in 2008, after several years of no treatments in the lake, uh, we had the highest number of plant finds we've ever had in the lake. Um, at that time, we extended our protocol to um, seven years of treatment. So, so I, I should give you a little bit of biology of hydrilla. Hydrilla is a plant that developed um, in parts of uh, Africa and Asia, where they um, tend to have monsoon rains. So there's uh, temporary lakes form uh, in what was otherwise a dry field in the non-monsoon times of year. So the plant, uh, its survival strategy is to send a tuber down into the, into the wet soil at, uh, of these temporary lakes. And that tuber can sit, even in dr the lake can dry up and it can sit there for five, six, seven years and wait for a monsoon to refill that basin. And then the plant very quickly goes through its life cycle and sends new tubers down. Um, you take that plant to California with our gorgeous weather and a lake like this with year-round uh, water um, and uh, the plants just, they can stay happy as can be for a very, very long time. So our application technique is a slow released, um, well initially if a plant is found, we use a contact herbicide which is copper based to, to immediately burn down the, uh, the uh, plant, uh, the bi biomass, so that we don't get fragmentation and, and additional tubers formed. And then we go into our long-term um, sonar, uh, sonar is the, the, I'm sorry, the, uh, the uh, product name, the label name, uh, fluoridone is the active ingredient. And we utilize a slow-release pellet, and that's when if you see our boats out there with a the large hopper on the front and they're throwing out clay pellets, um, we broadcast those um, roughly five times a year. Um, and those sit at the bottom of the, the lake and slowly, very slowly emit um, the fluoridone which takes care of any tubers that are uh, sprouting and, and beginning to grow. So we kill the plant at a very small, um, at, a, at a very, uh, right at the, the dirt level. But as I said, this year, um, it's been seven years since our last plant find was in 2016. Um, so this year, last year we were treating 85 acres still in nine different areas around the lake. Um, we did not reduce any acreage last year because 20, um, the, the previous years were so dry, the lake level was so low, um, we, that, that limited our ability to, um, to conduct survey. Uh, there was hundreds of yards of, of shoreline uh, that were just dry mud that we couldn't really survey, but tubers could certainly be living in there. Um, so we did treat 85.71 acres last year. Um, but this is the first year, like I said, since about 2007 that we're going to have no treatments. Um, that is our intention going into the year. If we find a plant, uh, we will have to conduct treatments. Um, and so uh, the confusion that I don't want to have, that I'm trying to avoid, is uh, we are going to be sending out our normal uh, notice of intent. Um, the, 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 uh, any property owner around the lake that touches the lake gets a letter from us every year um, that's signed by the agricultural commissioner, uh, notice of intent of our intent to, to treat, and then identifies the potential uh, products that we might use. Um, so we are still going to send those out, and, and I don't want this to be confusing to the, to the public, um, but initially we don't intend to have any treatments conducted this year. Um, but that that notification is, you know, we're legally required to do that if we make an application. And if we are to find a plant, uh, our, our protocol, our policy is to treat within uh, 48 hours of finding that plant. Um, and if we had to go through the public notification process, that would delay us uh, quite a bit. So uh, we're, you know, preemptively going to say that we potentially could treat, uh, but initially at the start of the year, we do not intend to do any herbicide applications in Clear Lake this year. Um, that's about all I wanted to say. Are there any questions uh, for us? Or um, do you want me to expand on any of, there's always a lot of confusion about what we're doing out there on the lake. Uh, the vast majority of the time we're just surveying. So, but the, the crew's throwing the hooks um, uh, to the lay person. It looks like someone throwing a, a application hose in the water. Um, so we, we, we get lots of questions about, you know, our treatments. So. Which, are, which are, is good. Questions are good. Yeah, absolutely. I have nothing to hide. <laughs> I appreciate you approaching the board and letting us, uh, let, letting us know the current status of hydrilla in the lake Perfect. and your plans. I want to open it up for question and comments to help guide the, the conversation any further. Are there any questions or comments? I don't have any. Supervisor Green. I assume uh, the 
plan to not treat anything as a general measure of success that absolutely what you've seen in past years you've kind of kept it down to a dual war yes. that said it's still endemic yes so going back to your previous statement we didn't do treatments and then it kind of bit you in the butt um, so how are you balancing that if you're not going to do treatments this year because so, of a general good state of affairs how do you know it's not biting you in the butt later? so, so this is um, I, I will say that this lake uh, nationwide is famous for for the eradication effort it's very unique um, in California we're lucky that we're so isolated um, there aren't boats coming you know from the Delta with hydrilla on it uh, hydrilla doesn't exist in the Delta um, so because because we're able to isolate and treat uh, we had the opportunity to eradicate it here and that's what we've We've pursued. Um, we at some point we have to stop treating. We ca we can't re you know there's no reason just continue to put pesticide in an area. Um, we do use a tracking system. Um, we have identified some areas that over the years had cycled in and out of treatments. We'd end treatments, and a few years later we'd find a plant and and we've made some tweaks to those areas, extended the treatment time or the or the size of those applications. Um, to try to tackle those problem areas. Um, but like I said, at some point we have to stop treating um, to, to just because, the, and it's a, it, the protocol that we use is in line with the, um, the biology of the plant as we know it for how long a typical tuber might last in the soil. Um, it's typically about five years. Um, and from what we've seen elsewhere in the state of uh, when in the past when we pulled uh, ponds out of treatment. It would usually take three to four years and, and we would find a plant. Um, that, that has repeated itself uh, in our history and that's why we went to the seven-year uh, protocol. And we've been, we've been reducing acreages uh, uh, seven years after treatment um, for, for many years now. And none of those prior, um, nothing has popped back up. Nothing has come, come back into uh, since 2016 was the last plant find. So. So we, for the last, I, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but we were reducing about 100 acres a year for, for four or five years there. And none of those acreages have ro rotated back into uh, treatment from a plant fine. So. Thank you for that. Any other questions or comments? So I, I get it that right now is a different time period because there's not hydrilla to be found, at least that you're aware of at this moment. But where would you typically find it? And would it be more on the Lakeport side where it's shallower? Would it be on the Clear Lake, Clear Lake Oaks side where it's a little bit deeper? Or is it all over? It's been found all over this lake. Um, there are some, some portions of the, the shoreline that don't... Um, that I don't think we've ever found plants, but but if I brought a map of the history of the lake, it's just ringed. Okay. Uh, it grew everywhere. Uh, we go out to usually about 20 feet deep, more or less. Um, that kind of changes on, like like you said, like the, the deeper, rockier side. Um, the type of sediment, you know, the real fluffy, sandy, or, or loose, loamy uh, sediment, they, it really likes that. The, the tubers can hang out there pretty easily and it establishes well, but it, it'll grow anywhere in this in this lake and it will grow anywhere in the state as well. Um, in the state of California, we have both biotypes. There's Monoecious and Dioecious hydrilla. Uh, we only have Monoecious here in Clear Lake, but um, California's unique. We're good at growing stuff, including things we don't want to grow, so. Um, but hydrilla, this, as you know, this lake is very, very um, uh, um, fertile, and you take a horrible water weed like hydrilla, and it just loves it, so. But it, it will grow anywhere in this lake. That's very eutrophic in our lake. Yeah. Yep. And um, just so the public's aware, I know I, I've gotten a little bit of education, but I could use a review. The type of chemicals that you do use uh, when doing the treatment, if you can describe that. Sure. So typically, our, our, our standard, it's a two-pronged approach. Um, when we have a plant find, we utilize a copper-based herbicide, which uh, we would call a contact herbicide. It, it literally almost instantaneously breaks down the cell wall of aquatic vegetation, and that is non-selective. It just knocks down all, burns down all vegetation. And we do that to burn the hydrilla plant back to the root crown. The root crown is still there and it will sprout up and, and keep growing. But that stops any aquatic weeds um, spread by fragmentation. You know, you, gr you mow your lawn and you throw the grass clippings away, it's totally fine. If you mowed hydrilla into a bunch of three inch sections, you would just be spreading thousands of, of plants. So we burn the plant down with the copper contact herbicide. 
And then uh, once a plant is found, if we f find a floating plant, that doesn't trigger treatment because it, it doesn't mean anything. It just means that that fragment was floating there. Um, I can't justify pouring chemical into a spot that something just moved through. But if we find a rooted plant, um, we will treat with copper. And then uh, the minimum acreage per the label, we create a five acre treatment area around that. And we treat, um, aquatic herbis uh, applications are kind of different. It's not like spraying a dandelion in your lawn. You're, you're actually, you know, the chemical is in a, a liquid portion of a lake that, that can move around. So we do a five acre, per the label, we do a five acre treatment area around that plant find. Um, and then that just gets into our regular rotation. And, and every five to six weeks, uh, we, we would make a, so it's fluoridone is the active ingredient uh, that we use there. Um, that's a very low, um, uh, a low concentration, slow release pellet that um, uh, we're lucky that hydrilla is particularly susceptible to. Um, but that's, that's the two prong approach that we utilize. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Absolutely. So, so if you've been so successful with hydrilla, is there any way that you can work with the county to move on to the next type <laughs> of aquatic weeds that we've been discussing here at our board uh, level before? So, uh, no, uh, unfortunately. I do, however, oversee the, um, the weed I feel weed like someone else has already asked this question. <laughs> the weed management area funding and uh, the county, uh, the department puts out money for, for uh, county weed control. So I, I work with Lake County on, the, on that. Um, but no, we don't. Uh, hydrilla, the department itself works on hydrilla because we're mandated by the Food and Ag Code to work on that. We do give out funds for other county weed control. And I will say that my staff are constantly looking. Um, we did find water hyacinth in, uh, at one of the boat ramps. And we spent a day or two with uh, nets getting it out of there because we know how bad water hyacinth could be. Um, water hyacinth, if you're not aware, is what's all over the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. Um, and uh, as a reference, uh, and that's what boating and waterways spends millions of dollars a year trying to control water hyacinth. Um, the state of Florida uh, did not eradicate hydrilla, and it has both hydrilla and hyacinth. And they spend four times as much money on hydrilla as they do on water hyacinth. Um, and you can look at the delta to see how bad hyacinth is. Just a, that's just a good reference on. Uh, hydrilla is considered the world's worst weed because of its impacts to uh, water. Well, so. I'm, I'm glad of your success here to at least uh, reduce that and mitigate Certainly. the problems that it could create for us. Yeah. And, and I just want everyone to know we will be here for years and years and years surveying. We're not gonna, we're not gonna turn anytime soon. I mean, with, they're they're gonna be out there looking every year. Um, this is a huge success story if we can. You, can... you had a little quiet hooray behind you. Oh, of course. For that, so thank you. <laughs> and so I would suggest if there's no further comments or questions, if you can stay there just in case there's a question from the audience that sure. we can't respond to. Uh, but I do want to open it up for public comment. And please come on up, Joan. I'm Joan Moss, and I want to know what is bad about hydrilla? Why do we not want hydrilla in our waters? Thank you. Uh, to answer the question, uh, hydrilla is, um, it is one of the fastest growing plants in the world. Um, it can grow up to a foot in a day uh, in extreme situations. Uh, it can grow under the light of a full moon. Um, it's just extremely, uh, good at growing uh, very quickly. Uh, it, as I said, it developed those subterranean tubers, which you can completely dry a pond out, kill every aquatic plant in it, or an irrigation ditch in the California aqueduct, which moves water from Northern California to Southern California. Um, and you can draw those bodies of water out and kill most every aquatic plant. Uh, when you fill that back up with water and you have hydrilla tubers present, it just says thank you for the haircut and, and immediately starts growing again. Um, so the, what hydrilla does, a impoundment that has hydrilla in it, uh, um, I'm gonna, there's a term called acre feet, which is what you measure the storage capacity of a, of a, of a pond or <coughs> reservoir. Um, if you have a full uh, monoculture of hydrilla, you will have 80% of that water body will be plant matter 
and only 20% of that water body will be actual water. When you try to pump water through uh, an irrigation system, uh, the same thing happens. You lose 80% of the capacity to move water from one part of the state to the other. That is the reason that the department uh, was mandated by Food and Ag Code 6048 to attempt to eradicate hydrilla wherever feasible. It is, but additionally to that, um, once you get that solid monoculture, there's no dissolved oxygen, there's no sunlight penetration. Uh, you, you, and hydrilla roots at the soil and it hits the surface and branches laterally and it forms a mat at the top. Um, it literally, that nothing is growing in that pond other than hydrilla. Um, initially when these weed beds start, uh, bass fishermen, which obviously love this lake, um, they love to fish the edges of weed beds. Um, so when any sort of aquatic weed comes in initially, um, it might provide some of that edge effect. Uh, hydrilla very quickly is 100% takes over the water body and there's no room for fish. There's no oxygen. There's no, it, it literally kills everything. It just makes black, murky, lifeless water underneath it. Appreciate the response. Thank sure. you for that. Are there any other public comments? Please come on up. My name is Angela DePomodau. I am the Lake County um, Aquatic Invasive Species Program Coordinator. I just wanted to provide a few items of support for this program and thanks. Um, it really is remarkable. So I've worked in six states and throughout any training for invasive species, hydrilla is like the biggest boogeyman out there. Um, in those six states I've worked in, there's been uh, examples of non-successful management and control. When I came to Clear Lake, the fact that I heard that hydrilla was on its way to being eradicated was remarkable. So this is very significant. Uh, the fact that you guys have been doing such a great job and instilled such an aggressive treatment is just is, is fascinating and very exciting. So I'm very excited over here. So um, thank you guys for your program. Um, we did work with your guys' program a few years ago to create a fact sheet for the public because there's lots of questions. So I have some of those here um, available for the public. We also have them at our office. They're also online. Um, one thing I will also want to mention is that the program staff at the Hydrilla program has been really great to work with. So you guys know water resources. We're resource constrained. We're strapped. Unfortunately, we're not on the lake every day. We can't just ride around in boats and look at what's going on on the lake. And so we really depend on our partners to be some of the eyes out there, let us know what's going on. And this program has been able to do that for us. So thank you to Mike and his team. If they notice anything out in the lake, they're letting me know they're sending pictures. If it looks like there might be a little fish kill, there's a little bit of a bloom forming, there's something weird they don't normally see, which they know because they're out there every day, they let us know right away. And that is some invaluable information that we, I don't know how we get else, elsewhere. Um, uh, you talked about the hyacinth watch or the hyacinth response. We had a hyacinth response that I was alerted to by Mike and a cove out in Glen Haven a few years ago. I was able to assemble a team and we went out there in a couple days, removed the water hyacinth, and then every year we've gone back and checked. Um, and it was in a little cove. It wasn't visible from the main lake. So even if we were out there doing our normal sampling, we would not have spotted it. But because Mike and his team was out there, they were able to do that and let us know. So um, really indebted to them and, and all the support that they've been able to do out on the lake and really help us be more efficient and effective with the funds and the resources that we have. I think that's it. Thank you so much and just support this program. Thank you very much. Come on up. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Chris Childers, I'm a fisheries biologist, and I just have a, a simple question uh, for you all. Uh, does fluoridone or cop copper sulfate have any negative effect on negative or native aquatic vegetation? Native aquatic vegetation. Yeah, and then uh, just, just to uh, move forward with that too, if it does, <coughs> that could potentially decrease juvenile hitch habitat, um, it could reduce fitness, and it could also reduce zooplankton in the lake which these uh, fish actually need to eat as juveniles. Uh, so uh, specific to native vegetation, um, the copper-based herbicide is very non-selective. Uh, it, it will impact any vegetation in the lake. Um, the fluoridone at the rates, I, I don't want to speak, I don't know exactly which plant you're talking about. Um, as far as the hitch are concerned, the fluoridone potentially could impact any um, <coughs> plant. Uh, fluoridone does not impact uh, algae. 
Um, it's a systemic, so it has to move through the plant. It's absorbed at one location and translocated to another location. Um, so algae don't do that. So algae are not impacted by fluoridone. Um, but as in regards to the hitch, we work very closely uh, with uh, uh, Ben Ewing from California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, prior to any, particularly any copper treatment, if we were to conduct a copper treatment, uh, we have a protocol where we, we contact Ben uh, Ewing with CDFW prior to, and uh, he will either go do surveys or let us know if there is any uh, suspected hitch habitat in that area. Um, to date, I don't recall that ever being an issue, but we work hand in hand with, with uh, Ben Ewing prior to those applications. Um, and he basically gives the green light um, that, that we can continue our applications. Um, I don't, Mike, do you, have we ever altered one because of the hitch? I don't believe we have. No. So. Thank you for your response. Sure. I see no further hands in Zoom or hands or folks coming up to the mic in the chamber. I'll bring it back to the board. Any final comments or questions? Really appreciate you coming to us and uh, providing an update on uh, the process and the success. And uh, let's make sure to keep coming so that we don't have that gap like we have in the past and uh, so that we can continue to keep it as mitigated as possible. Will do. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. Thanks for the opportunity. Yep. Johanna, I made a promise I'd give this to you. <laughs> All right. Let's move on to our 2 p.m. item, 6.11, presentation of overview of Lake County 2050 general plan and local area plans updates. And we have a whole team coming up. Come on up and sit down at the chairs. Make yourselves comfortable. We should have Tanya and Allison and Jacqueline, maybe, or Andrea. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Maria Turner, Community Development Director, come to talk to you about my favorite subject. <laughs> we have recently launched the update for both the general plan and all eight local area plans. Thanks to board support, we were able to bring on board a renowned planning firm to assist us with the preparation of these community vision documents. And we do have a few members of the PlaceWorks staff that are on our core team of um, attending today via Zoom. General plans are updated every 20 years. Local area plans uh, are similar planning documents in that they are community vision driven plans that talk about what a community wants for itself, where it's going, where it wants to go for the next few years. Because we had such outdated plans, the board supported the decision to update these all at the same time. So this is a very ambitious project. We're all really excited. Oh, and just you know, to add some more fun, we were able to secure funding uh, through the administrative office, securing an APGP grant to throw in the climate action adaptation plan as well. And so because those are all community vision driven, um, it works out just splendidly that PlaceWorks is, is working with us to assist on all of those at the same time. So we don't have multiple vendors holding multiple county visioning meetings. So this actually couldn't have worked out better. The core team um, on the county is uh, myself, our principal planner, uh, Michelle Iris, our community develop, uh, assistant community, what are you, deputy? Sorry, <laughs> our deputy community development uh, administrator, Shannon Walker-Smith. And you'll notice next to her is our another awesome support team. These are the, the wonderful women of AmeriCorps who are going to also assist us so that we can pretty much be everywhere in the county um, gathering input from anybody who walks by who can't outrun us. Additionally, at some of our future local area plan meetings, you'll see various members of community development staff um, that will be helping out as well. 
I am going to now hand it over um, to PlaceWork staff to walk you through an overview of the process as well as our community engagement plan, which will help us realize the goal of securing these documents as community vision-driven planning documents. I'll turn it over. Thank you. Great. Right, thank you, Director Turner, and thanks for your time, Supervisors and Chair. My name is Tanya Sundberg. I'm a principal with PlaceWorks. Really excited to be here today to present this overview. I also have with me Jacqueline Potsman Rohr, who's part of our team. We're going to be tag teaming on this presentation. So let me get this going. Okay, so um, just to start, um, this slide presents a broad overview of this project. We're calling it Lake County 2050. Uh, this includes a comprehensive update to the 2008 general plan, plus all eight of the county's local area plans. Um, those are listed here on this slide. Uh, it also includes environmental review of those updates. That's required by the California Environmental Quality Act, or CEQA, uh, and that's done through a preparation of an environmental impact report. And finally, as uh, Director Turner mentioned, it includes this concurrent preparation of a climate adaptation plan and that provides a countywide framework to adapt to climate change. So we'll cover an overview of all those components as part of this presentation. So I want to start with some background information about these plans that we're updating. Um, and I'll focus a little bit on some of the state legislative updates that we need to keep in mind. Um, in a lot of cases, a big part of the update is to make sure that the plans comply with cha changes in state law that have happened since the previous general plan and local area plans were prepared. So starting with the general plan, um, this is a long range plan. In this case, we're gonna be looking out to the year 2050 uh, and it guides the county's decisions on a pretty broad variety of topics that affect the unincorporated parts of the county. Uh, the general plan is often referred to as the constitution that guides land use and development in a jurisdiction. It's called a constitution because it provides an overarching framework for all of the more detailed regulations and plans um, that affect how development can happen. So the, typically what a general plan does is it first lays out a community identified vision for the future, and then it presents goals, policies, and actions to support the jurisdiction in achieving that vision. Uh, so it's important to provide the, gen, uh, the, it's important for the general plan to provide consistent direction so everyone has some certainty about the future of the community. And because the general plan has, um, it covers such a wide variety of topics, it, requires really careful thinking and also real effective community engagement and input uh, so that we can balance growth, conservation, and quality of life in a way that supports the community's vision. And then last, the, the uh, general plan also serves a purpose of documenting baseline and environmental conditions. And that's really so that everyone has a shared understanding of what the starting point is for the plan. So there are eight topics that state law requires a general plan to address. Those are typically in, in the form of individual chapters or elements, um, but local agencies do have discretion to uh, cover other topics to meet needs of the local community. Uh, and there's also not any real requirements about how you organize the topics. So these can be standalone topics or chapters, um, or they can, can be combined into um, broader chapters. In your current Lake County General Plan, you cover the required um, topics from the state uh, land use, open space, circulation, housing, conservation, safety, and noise. Um, you don't currently cover environmental justice. That's a new topic that I'll cover a little bit later in the presentation. Um, your current general plan also addresses some optional topics, public facilities and services, geothermal resources, and an aggregate resources management plan. Um, and then it pulls out agricultural resources and water resources as standalone separate chapters. Those are more broadly required through the open space and conservation topics, but um, in your general plan, they're currently pulled out as individual chapters. A um, couple notes here too, that the housing element is part of the general plan, but it needs to be updated on a more frequent schedule than the rest of the general plan. So we typically will do that through a, a separate process and that's what's happening here. The your housing element will be updated separately. Um, and similarly, the aggregate resources management plan will be uh, updated separately from the Lake County 2050 process. And then just a final note here that um, it's really important for the general plan to be internally consistent and for other county plans to be consistent with the general plan so that it can effectively function in this role as a constitution for the county. And so that community members have that certainty about these aspects of 
their future. So land use is one of the topics that receives the most attention in a general plan update. Um, and part of that is because of this map called the land use map, um, big part of the general plan. It identifies what kind of land use can be developed on each parcel in the unincorporated county. Um, and then it also provides some basic parameters for how that land use can be developed. So um, that might mean in residential areas, it, it tells how, you know, the, how, the maximum number of homes per acre that can be developed or the intensity of a non-residential use, like based on the ratio of square footage to lot size. So those are part of the general plan. And then that sets you up for your zoning map and zoning regulations, which provide a lot more detail on exactly how those land uses can be developed. So I will turn it over now to Jacqueline, who's going to talk about the health and safety element update. Thanks, Tanya. So uh, to start off, what is the safety element? Uh, as Tanya said, it, it is one of the mandatory elements of a general plan with a focus on natural and human caused hazards in Lake County with the overall goal of protecting the county, including residents, businesses, uh, infrastructure, and the environment from natural disasters and other hazards. So these physical hazards can include flooding, severe weather, emergency evacuations, wildfires, and also hazards that may worsen due to climate change, such as extreme heat and drought. Next slide. So the health and safety element is just one part of Lake County's overall approach to protecting the community against hazards, and it integrates with several other county plans to do this. The health and safety element is a high level broad document that discusses the county's comprehensive public safety approach. There's also the local hazard mitigation plan, which is a more detailed short term plan that focuses on specific implementation actions. The emergency operations plan, which is the county's internal plan for response and recovery and the community wildfire protection plan, which provides an evaluation of wildfire hazards and then strategies for reducing wildfire risk throughout the county. And this project also includes the development of a climate adaptation plan, uh, which will focus on increasing the resilience of human built and natural systems to climate change hazards. And the safety element will integrate information from each of these plans and tie into them as appropriate to help create a comprehensive public safety approach. And then the other benefits of updating this element are to ensure consistency with the other gener general plan elements and agency plans, comply with state regulations, which I'll go over in the next slide, and then improve eligibility for grant funding to implement resiliency and hazard mitigation projects. Next slide. So since the previous update to the general plan, several new laws have come into effect uh, for the safety element. These updates to the government code increase requirements for flood and wildfire sections of the element to identify responsible agencies, ensure coordination among these agencies, as well as minimize the risk to new buildings and critical facilities. There's also a focus on climate, and climate change and adaptation through SB 379, requiring uh, safety elements to prepare a vulnerability assessment that identifies risk to hazards and then develop a comprehensive set of goals, policies, and implementation actions to build resilience in the community. SB 2140 allows for the incorporation of the local hazard mitigation plan, which makes the county potentially eligible for increased disaster relief funds. And then three of the new laws, SB 99, AB 747, and AB 1409 focus on evacuation, requiring the identification of evacuation routes and location, capacity, and safety, as well as evacuation-constrained areas. Next slide. The vulnerability assessment is the analysis that will be conducted uh, for the health and safety element update. This assessment will evaluate how people and community assets, such as buildings, infrastructure, and economic systems, may be affected by climate change hazards, as well as the degree to which they're vulnerable. The vulnerability assessment will also assess the availability of existing policies, programs, resources to help people prepare for, uh, respond to, and recover from impacts. And the results of this analysis will be, will include a prioritized set of vulnerabilities that will then 
inform the resilience and adaptation policies of the health and safety element update and the strategies in the climate adaptation plan. And in Lake County, the expected local climate change impacts include increases in intense rainfall leading to flooding, more frequent extreme heat events, an increase in frequency and length of drought conditions, and then more frequent and intense regional wildfires. So with that, I'll hand it back over to Tanya to go over environmental justice. Thanks, Jacqueline. So this is the last uh, topic that we wanna highlight. Um, this is an entirely new topic that state law requires you to address in your general plan based on a state law passed in 2016. So it's, so again, it's not in your current general plan. Um, just for setting some um, groundwork here, just thinking about the, how we define environmental justice. Um, you can see here how it's defined in state law. Uh, I think a lot of people have different opinions on what this definition should be, um, but I, I think about it simply as just the basic right of everybody to be able to live, work, go to school, play, and worship in a healthy and clean environment. Um, but what this law recognizes and why we are looking at environmental justice in the general plan is that uh, low-income communities, communities of color, and tribal communities have experienced a combination of historical discrimination and neglig negligence. And today, um, these communities are often struggling with disproportionately polluted and unhealthy environments, um, as well as disproportionate social and economic disadvantages like poverty or housing instability. Um, so under this law, communities that are facing that combination of challenges are termed disadvantaged communities. And the focus of the general plan environmental justice element is to improve conditions in those communities. So the state law that um, led to this new requirement is called SB 1000. Uh, it identifies a specific list of environmental justice issues that need to be addressed in the environmental justice element. Um, and the county doesn't have to be limited to these issues, but it needs to at least address these issues. So for any um, communities that are identified as disadvantaged um, in the county, this environmental justice element will need to identify policies and programs to reduce pollution exposure, provide adequate public facilities and services, promote access to food that's affordable and nutritionally adequate, um, provide uh, safe and sanitary housing, and promote access to opportunities for physical activity. And also when we think about making these changes, we know it can't be a top-down process. We need to emphasize equity and policy making, and that requires us to involve all of the affected communities in the decisions that affect their lives. Um, and then finally, um, based on this legislation, we also need to make choices that prioritize improvements in those disadvantaged communities that have historically faced the greatest impacts. Okay, so we're gonna move on now to the local area plans. Um, local area plans are also long range plans, but they're for a more localized area. So they provide um, policy and design guidance that's really attuned to the local area. Uh, so the local area plans operate under the umbrella of the general plan. So it's important that they're consistent with the general plan um, and that they also complement the other local area plans. Um, so as part of this role, they serve as a more precise supplement to the general plan for the local area. Uh, finally, the uh, local area plans also provide land use and zoning information, an important part of their function. So as part of this update under Lake County 2050, we do plan to reorganize the general plan and local area plans to streamline the content and avoid redundancy. Um, so many of these required and optional general plan topics that we've talked about are our best plan at a more localized scale. So we plan to cover those in the local area plans. That includes land use, circulation, open space conservation and recreation, environmental justice and public facilities and services. And then the remaining topics will be addressed at the countywide scale as part of countywide elements in the general plan. And that includes health and safety, noise, geothermal resources, agricultural resources, water resources, housing, and the aggregate resources management plan. I'm gonna turn it back over to Jacqueline to talk about the EIR. So the California Environmental Quality Act, or CEQA, is the state's primary environmental protection and disclosure law. Uh, for the general plan update, we'll be preparing an environmental impact report, or EIR, which will be an informational document for decision-making for the pro project. The EIR will disclose information about the effects of the project on the environment, identify mitigation measures to reduce significant impacts, 
and describe feasible alternatives to the proposed project that are designed to reduce any environmental impacts identified. The EIR must be certified prior to project approval as well. And this pro process does provide two public comment periods uh, one during the scoping phase to tell us what to analyze, which occurred uh, this past January and February of this year. And then the second will be during the public review phase of the draft EIR to comment on the environmental analysis itself. Next slide. So this project will also include a climate adaptation plan, which will be on a slightly different schedule and timeline than the general plan and EIR. The Climate Adaptation Plan is part of the Adaptation Planning Grant Lake County receives, and this plan will build off of the work conducted for the, the health and safety element through the Climate Vulnerability Assessment, uh, and also include additional community outreach and engagement to develop an adaptation plan and implementation framework for increasing resilience of residents, visitors, the built system, and natural resources to hazards that may worsen due to climate change. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Tanya to go over the schedule. Thanks, Jacqueline. So this uh, slide just shows broad, broad picture what, what we're looking at for Lake County 2050 overall. Um, we are planning on a three-year process. We kicked off the project last fall. We've been doing uh, background research and setting up for community engagement since then. Um, uh, we are, as uh, Jacqueline just described, the climate adaptation plan, as she mentioned, that's on a separate, slightly different schedule. So that just kicked off. We're expecting that work to be complete uh, in fall of 2025. Uh, for the countywide elements work, we expect that to move relatively quickly with draft elements anticipated in fall of this year. Um, and then for the local area plans, we're initiating that um, right now, this spring, and we're, we'll be working on alternative approaches to policy and land use guidance in those plans through this fall. Um, and then the work to prepare the full drafts of the local area plans will continue through spring of 2025. Um, and at that point, we'll be able to begin the EIR evaluation, which will take us to publication of the draft EIR in spring of 2026. Um, and then we anticipate public review and adoption concluding in fall of 2026. So I'm going to turn your attention now to a separate attachment in your staff report. I have a few slides to go over um, this community engagement plan. This was one of our initial tasks for Lake County 2050, and it's a plan that lays out how the general plan and local area plans update process will reach the entire community. Um, so the plan starts by identifying the engagement objectives. Uh, as an overarching objective, the project aims to hear from a wide range of community members to shape these plans. But more specifically, the desired outcomes are to ensure that community members understand the project and why it's important, uh, promote robust and diverse community participation that represents all perspectives, and builds public trust in the process and support for the general plan and local area plans. We know that historically certain groups have been underrepresented in planning related decisions, so the plan lays out how um, we can make intentional efforts to reach and include these groups. And that includes low-income households, Native American tribes, non-English speakers, older residents, younger residents, and renters. And then um, the plan also lays out the activities, the main activities that we'll undertake to engage the community. That includes a general plan advisory committee, or GPAC, um, that you helped to recently establish. We, that consists of stakeholders from um, the community that have a different range of perspectives. They'll guide the process. And they'll also be acting as community ambassadors. We also are planning uh, to hold community focused workshops for the local area plan updates process. Uh, we'll have three rounds of those workshops and each round will have one meeting in each of the local area plan planning areas. Uh, that may be a part of the established advisory body for that planning area, which is the case for our first round of community workshops. Um, we just recently scheduled those for April. They will be part of the advisory body um, meeting, and we just listed those on our website. So we're um, right now, as we speak, initiating outreach to spread the word about those upcoming workshops. Uh, and then we will, we will be holding some stakeholder focus groups on individual topics, and those topics are still to be determined. And last, I just want to highlight here our project website. This is live and ready to use. It's lakecounty2050.org. Um, please uh, help spread the word and uh, direct your friends and family to this website. 
they can learn about the project. Um, there's a survey available right now um, will that will help us to learn more about some of the key issues for the update. So really encourage folks to check that out. So just real quick on terms of next steps. Um, this is, of course, a three-year process, so there's a lot ahead of us. But in the near term, I think the main thing we are looking for is um, folks to help spread the word about the project and our upcoming community workshop series in April. So please check out the website, check out the survey, um, come to one of these meetings and, and um, encourage folks to, to do that because uh, we want to hear from as many folks as we can. So this concludes our presentation. Uh, I thank you for your time and welcome any questions. If we could highlight one last item. Um, I briefly mentioned our AmeriCorps team, a, a group of, of awesome local women that will be boosting our presence in the community. So I'd like our Deputy Community Development Administrator to bring them up, um, introduce them, and just kind of let you know a number of the events that we plan on uh, attending. Good afternoon, board. Um, thank you, Maria. So I um, have been working on the community engagement piece of this project and we have partnered with NCO's um, AmeriCorps CERC team to help us out as we try to gather as much input on this initial survey as we can. Um, these lovely ladies, I'm going to allow them to introduce themselves in just a moment, um, will be helping us out at that first round of local area plan meetings. We're going to be uh, facilitating some small group breakouts and they'll assist with that. And then they're planning to attend a variety of events through April and early May to collect input on that survey from those <clears throat> folks that are not attending community meetings with uh, an effort to really target those target audiences that were discussed in the PowerPoint presentation. Um, those events will include um, a variety of neighbor fests that are being planned by NCO as well as a senior event um, and I'll let them um, talk about any additional events. Once we have wrapped up the initial survey, um, it, which that's going to conclude in May, as we go through the remainder of the process, the different stakeholder groups and the different topics that we need to address, we may develop more community focused questions. And if um, when we get to that point, the AmeriCorps members will continue to help us um, canvas the community for answers to those questions. So it really is our intention to draw in as much community input as we can. We have also, um, with the help of admin and auditor's office, uh, so thank you to them, we have gotten approval to purchase some incentive items because we know that incentivize incentivizing survey responses from underrepresented groups is a best practice. Um, and we want to make sure that we're um, doing our best effort in that regard. And without further ado, I will um, have the AmeriCorps members introduce themselves. Um, maybe just say how long you've um, lived in Lake County and um, why you're um, interested in being involved in this project. I'm Amanda Joe. Um, I've lived in Lake County. Uh, I moved here in third grade, so I don't know, a while ago. Um, I I love it here. I moved here from Daly City, and I, it's nice to be in a community that actually cares about each other. That it, there's there's nothing. This is home, and so it's nice to be a part of something that's making home better. Hi, I'm Dawn. I've been here for about 12 years now. I moved from the Bay Area, and uh, it's it's nice. It's definitely different up here. I like it because it's a little low, lower pace. I was used to the hustle bustle and all the traffic, so it's nice to not have so much traffic. But um, I'm just happy to be here and just willing to do. Hopefully we can get all this situated and get everything ready for all the plans. We have a lot going on in uh, April. Um, Tammy's not here, so but she'll be here next time. Um, but it should be fun doing all this for you guys. Um. I'm Pamela Coleman. I'm born and raised here in Lake County, um, and I'm excited for all the events we have coming up in April and to be more part of the community and help make it better. Thank you, ladies, so much. We're very appreciative for the partnership with NCO. Thank you. We would also like to extend our appreciation to our technical side of our team, Sam Houston, um, at Thomas DeWalt. 
DeWalt uh, with PEG TV and the assistance of Chair Supervisor in working out the, all the different technical sides. As a result of these ongoing conversations, we realize that there are a number of local area plan meetings that have sketchy uh, and somewhat unreliable internet access. Because of that, we'd love it if, as we're getting the word out, and as you're assisting us in, in getting the word out for these local meetings, if you would encourage strongly on-site participation. We really don't want to lose anybody's input. Every, everybody has a voice here. Um, and uh, so on-site participation is our most reliable way of, of having your voice heard during those meetings. Or feel free at any time to send us uh, an email um, with your comments. Uh, that would be at Lake County 2050 at lakecountyca.gov. Or you can go on the website as well, lakecounty2050.org. Is it org? Yes. Yes. And we welcome any questions, comments that you might have. Thank you so much for your participation and the explanation of how all of this will progress. Thank you to AmeriCorps and the partnership with NCO to provide some extra capacity to be able to deal with all of these large projects. Uh, very thankful that we're moving forward with this. It's been a long time coming, so excited to hear that uh, it's not just been approved, that there's, uh, we're ready. Any comments or questions from board members? Supervisor Green. Yeah, thank you. I wonder if um, uh, I'm looking uh, specifically at slides four and 13. So on slide four, we talk about what the uh, general required topics are for the general plan. Land use would be one of them. On 13, I notice land use is parsed out as a local area plan topic, but I don't see a general land use policy that would be addressed countywide. So I know this may filter up somehow, but can you explain how the required general plan elements um, that are not named in slide 13 as a countywide element that may be addressed uh, within the local area plans? I guess I'm trying to find out how we get consistency among the required general plan elements um, when they're parsed off into these local area plans where by definition consistency is something we may not achieve. We, we want to drill down. So it's just a, how do general plans in general live? What are the required elements? And how did we mix and match these various topics in the countywide elements identified and in the local area plan topics? Thank you, I appreciate that question. So because our local area plans were so outdated and we were going to update them simultaneously with the general plan, and actually local area plans are considered sort of sub-documents of the overall general plan, we decided to put the more robust information in the local area plans so that we could make sure we're really capturing the community's vision for the future. The housing element uh, or the land use element of the general plan, like a number of the other required elements, could be found either in the general plan or in our local area plans. They just have to be covered in our, in our planning documents. And so we've, um, we've kind of relied on the flexibility that the state does allow for us to, to put more of the focus of the future planning within our local area plans. But it is the goal uh, to have these be synchronous, uh, synchronized plans. So they should not be inconsistent with each other. And I think that um, moving the land use element over to the local area plans will help keep that consistent as well. And PlaceWorks can jump in if I left anything out. Looks like you did well. Uh, as far as the uh, PEG TV thing, uh, there are not going to be some new locations. Those locations are definitely where the unknowns are, hence the letting people know, make sure that you are attending in person just in case. Uh, there has been some on and off um, broadband capacity in some of the other locations that we know, uh, but at least it's a location that we know and, and we'll be able to diagnose and, and deal with that. And so hopefully we'll, we'll do the best that we can. Uh, those videos will be posted on our platforms that PEG TV has, including our channel, but we'll also be providing the videos back to the county so the county can post them wherever they feel that it's needed to be posted. Uh, thank you for that relationship and uh, looking forward to see how that works out. And one more highlight, uh, this morning we did secure the services of Gilbert Rangel for on-site Spanish translation. So we're really excited to team up with uh, the Equal Lingual.
You guys move fast. That was only brought up yesterday. We're not messing around. <laughs> we can over adapt and overcome, but all the details we can get nailed down early are better for us. Awesome. Supervisor Sutton. Yeah, just uh, one thing in the countywide elements, as Supervisor Green was talking about, um, just to make sure we have uh, cultural resources. Um, I know it's never been added to any of the plans in the past, but definitely a conversation I think that needs to be had throughout our conversations right now because, as you know, most of our tribal nations are not actually sitting on our tribal lands. The ancestral lands were taken from us. We were removed. Most of the construction and other stuff done in all counties, you know, especially in our county, is on our ancestral land. So cultural resources, I think, is something that's missing in there. I just, as I was reading the resources, I thought I'd mention it right now. That will be included in the environmental analysis, but I, I also want to take this moment to highlight the value of tribal input as we go through this process. Um, I mean, I guess I don't need to tell you guys, Lake County is unique, I think, in, in its assets of, of the tribal history and the, the, the resources that we do have here. And as we proceed, we want to make sure that we have input from all of our community members. That includes people who are affiliated or live on sovereign ground as well. Um, and so uh, our planning commissioner from District 3 made a, a wonderful recommendation at the, at when we did this similar presentation then, um, that is just saying that sometimes tribal members are uncomfortable going traveling to community meetings. So perhaps we should uh, make the opportunities or take advantage of any opportunity to go and meet with their tribal council and gather input in, a, in an environment that is comfortable, um, which uh, I appreciate that, that Supervisor Crandall is already assisting um, on that way. And additionally, we've reached out to the tribal EPAs, and I think we're going to be added to their April agenda. So we'll get to meet with the different tribal uh, environmental uh, leadership uh, at their group meetings. So we are open to and welcoming all opportunities. Um, and so if, please, if you think of another opportunity that you think would be valuable, let us know. Thank you for the question. Vice Chair Crandall? I was just going to add that with the um, PEG TV, uh, it'll be posted on YouTube, like we like mentioned. Um, how much time, Just I'm just trying to, how much time will folks have if like they miss the meeting, that they're able to watch the PEG TV uh, and they want to make a comment, they'll have a way to go from there, like, if that makes sense? Absolutely. Um, I don't know the, the normal turnaround time, but as soon as those videos become available, we will post them in a number of locations on the Lake County 2050 site. Um, also, uh, I think we're going to get, I'm not sure if we're going to get placed on the agenda site. Um, like we do have the, the GPAC meetings are posted there, um, but the videos should be available. And it's not like we're going to, you know, cut off input yeah. the day after the meeting. So anybody who wants to, to catch up on a meeting that they missed and send in input is most welcome to do so. And, and what the other discussion we had earlier to when we were talking about seating a position for the GPAC, um, we talked about those other advisory committees per se, mm -hmm. and that I know for for that situation, I think that's where I know if there's a tribe in each district, and we do go that route. Uh, I know that a, appointing somebody with the experience of the cultural resources would be a big benefit as well. So I'm just adding that input. Wonderful, and whatever the supervisors can do to encourage applications um, focused in that area would be most appreciated. Absolutely. Um, well, we did have a conversation earlier about the area planning committees, and so I don't know if you want to just take a moment for the people that maybe weren't part of that conversation. Well, it's a decision that is yet to be made by the board. But it's a proposal uh, that you'll be bringing to us. Indeed. It is tentatively scheduled for the next Board of Supervisors meeting um, for the board to consider establishing eight uh, local area plan advisory committees, the purpose of which as will be described and put before you next week, um, is to really drill down on the community specific, um, what I think of nuts and bolts, like where are the community growth boundaries going to go, that sort of a thing. And additionally, um, to allow opportunities for the community to be heard on a micro on a, or on an on a area plan level um, in order to secure as much input uh, and deliberation as possible. 
Right. So I'm looking forward to that. As someone who has their district pretty much equally divided into three area plans, but this is going to be a lot of work. Um, and I think it's going to also take a while to figure out how to um, make those appointments um, with the area plan. So it might be, when do you think you want, I mean, I know this isn't a conversation for today, but, um, you know, if we, if we do visit that um, at our next board meeting, it would be helpful to maybe have time to discuss this with the uh, max too. Yes, um, yes, and I will be happy to discuss that. Okay, great. At the next board meeting. And, and I believe that would be finalized prior to the beginning because April 8th, April 10th is the first one. So hypothetically, should the board decide to establish these eight um, groups, we would then um, rely on the administrative office, team up with them to get the press release out to solicit applications. So the timeline would actually be establishing what I call lay packs after our first local area plan meeting. Uh, but we, we do have time in between those, although our, our timeline is a very ambitious one and there's work going on all the time for it, um, we will then look to weave in these local area plan advisory committee meetings so that they will help inform the, the ongoing GPAC meetings as well. Okay. I just see the opportunity during the uh, going to all the MACs and all the other meetings to be able to say, Here, here's what we've just created. We're going to be looking for applications. That's a good advertisement platform uh, at that point since you're already meeting with the community uh, right there and then. Uh, my, my last thought uh, in order to ensure this is based on what Vice Chair Crandall was mentioning is maybe on the agendas having a link to where the videos will be uploaded, whether it's the Lake 2050 uh, website or not. That way it's an easy access to get those things and um, let me know if you need any other uh, maybe PEG uh, stuff. I would prefer that it go to a Lake County uh, thing that we advertise since it's our agenda, uh, but happy to add anything else where we would be uploading it to as well. Awesome. Thank you. I've been hogging the whole time. Do you have anything to add? No? And, and I do have one last question for you, uh, just a curiosity. Um, right now, and there's two plans where the cities are kind of embedded. Are the cities going to be carved out? Because I know there's not been confusion, but there's been statements uh, that the cities are part of such and such plan when obviously the county doesn't get to make a plan for the city jurisdictions. Uh, just kind of curious if it's, uh, you'll see a carve out on this new map for those individual area plans. Thank you. We have taken advantage of a number of opportunities to behave regionally, and that is targeted around our climate adaptation um, areas, both in the climate adaptation plan as well as the health and safety plan, climate vulnerability analysis, and the countywide evacuation plan. In those, it was appropriate, um, as we discussed with the city managers, appropriate to just go regionally and, and just treat it as Lake County as a whole. However, since the city of Lakeport and the city of Clear Lake are standalone jurisdictions with their own general plans and their own, uh, not when they have area plans, um, but their general plans, they are not included in the community visioning that we are doing for our planning areas as well as our general plan. And the same thing would be said as well about tribal land too. Indeed. Where it's embedded within the area plans, but again, no jurisdiction over those areas from the county. We have had some discussion regarding any value of our climate plan for tribal nations, which are also responsible for their own climate plans. Uh, but so far, we haven't really found that, that nexus because, uh, you know, the tribes respond to federal, not California state plans like we do. So, um, but we're always looking for these opportunities, though. So I have a stupid question to ask. I know we're looking at the EIR and CEQA. Is there any benefit by looking at certain areas where I feel like we're either relying a more on federal uh, funding? Uh, we've been getting a lot of funding through congressional support, uh, but also because of the status of our budget at the state level that maybe that, that will push us to get more federal support or seek more federal support where certain areas might get reviewed in a NEPA perspective so that again it allows us to maybe go through certain processes faster in the future as we develop? You don't have to answer that today. It's just a, a random question. thought. I will be happy to take it to the team. 
for further discussion. I know that uh, we, we don't have any plan to do a, a NEPA analysis of, of a state project or a state-oriented project okay. at this time. Thank you very much. Any further? Oh, Supervisor Green. Yeah, this may be for the later discussion on the uh, lay PCs, I think you got them. Um, but before we go too far down that road, um, for the eight plan areas we have called out, uh, for example, Lakeport area plan we discussed last week, it includes part of Kelseyville. I was just looking at it. It doesn't include parts of Scotts Valley that are currently included in the Upper Lake plan. So, um, and we're about to, depending on what happens when this comes back, have not just robust uh, input from our municipal advisory councils, but it sounds like we may be spinning up some advisory councils that follow a different geography. So I don't know how helpful, the, I, I know it's a baseline, we're kind of stuck with it, um, but the current mapping of our area plans is not contiguous in any way with our town hall regions. Um, and I'm, I'm trying, I'm just struggling how to resolve that because I'm bending over backwards to get uh, my guys from Scotts Valley here for a special meeting to provide input on the Lakeport area plan. Didn't even occur to me until I looked at the maps now. Maybe I need to cart them up to Upper Lake for a meeting too. So how, how, am I, how are you going to balance, because I'm not going to, how are you going to be able to balance the stated geography of our baseline area plans with the knowledge that our communities of interest and our municipal advisory councils in particular don't represent the geography of those area plans, with the exception of the one we just created. Well, we do keep in mind that the municipal area councils, uh, such as Scotts Valley, um, have a larger purpose than just the general plan. So um, they do comment on a variety of land use elements, but they also comment, or they also are advisory bodies for a whole other slew of things that doesn't have anything to do with this. So we, we, we decided to use our municipal area councils as the kickoff locations. One, because you already have a focused body that continually talks about community issues. And these members are, are also getting messages out to the greater community. Um, so it was a great starting point. But to answer your question about boundaries, during our first um, local area plan meetings coming in April, the question of do these boundaries still reflect our communities is actually one that we're going to cover. There may be some adjustments done so that we, going forward, reflect the communities as they are currently. And I would suggest that the MACs are more of a community-based, while area plans are more geographically based in of what's appropriate to talk about all at the same time. Uh, so I think it confuses things because we're utilizing the MACs to try to get access to the community to get feedback on, but I think they're two separate things. Uh, in my opinion, and I think that that, you that think goes right in line with what you just stated. Too. Absolutely, area plans are more of thematic, kind of similar communities. Like you have the Rivieras, which has all four um, HOAs in that large collection of subdivisions, and um, uh, Kelseyville, which is more agrarian or, or commercial. So it focuses on Kelseyville, Big Valley, and and Finley. So um, yeah. We're definitely open to public input, and we have been approached by a few members of the public already um, wanting to discuss possibly adjusting the boundaries. And so that will be one of the areas that we talk about. All right. Thank you so much. Let's go ahead and open it up for the public. I don't think I've done that yet. Please raise your hand if you're on Zoom or come to the microphone in the chamber. And we have Betsy Kahn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, everybody else. Um, uh, I have, a, unfortunately, a, a lengthy list of concerns about this, uh, and uh, many of those concerns that I have uh, uh, been talking to our other committee members about um, have to do with the uh, uh, outreach and education for the public. Uh, I find the survey to be a, a very big disappointment uh, and I'll certainly provide my comments in detail to uh, to uh, Maria and the crew, uh, but I just do want to explain uh, the the, uh, the the necessity to have actual data 
or making evaluations of prioritizing uh, uh, policies and goals in the general plan needs to be based on actual real data. And that we have many, many sources for that real data. The surveys are almost a random sampling of whoever might feel like uh, uh, being involved in, uh, uh, you know, and maybe they heard about it, maybe they didn't. Uh, but real data is actually very valuable. Uh, the the uh, There's some uh, ambiguity in the survey itself, so uh, I'd like to have an opportunity to work with the with the uh, uh, CDD and uh, uh, make this uh, uh, element of the content analysis uh, far more specific. And uh, as we, we need to talk about those uh, area maps, et cetera. Et cetera. In the uh, regard to the Lakeport area plan, the city and Scotts Valley Water Conservation District uh, have a, a very important relationship because the groundwater basin in Scotts Valley supplies roughly half of the uh, potable water to the city itself, but the area plan doesn't include the city. So we need to have an intergovernmental uh, relationship there to have a, a comprehensive, uh, you know, reality-based uh, area plan that, that comes out that uh, includes everything. Uh, so this, those are just some suggestions. Um, uh, the uh, the background report, I think, is uh, very important to us uh, to to lead to the analysis and, and prioritization of uh, what we come up with for uh, especially for our safety element. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments, and please do submit the the rest of your comments via email. Any other hands in the room or in Zoom? And seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. This was a presentation only to make sure everyone, ourselves included, um, are alerted as to the process and when things are happening. Uh, appreciate everything that you've put together to get this uh, beast moving. Uh, and uh, it's exciting. Thank you. And I think that, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. And that will conclude our open session items for today. We are going to go back to closed session. We have two more items, public employee evaluation, public works director, and registrar of voters, and that's 8.1 and 8.2 respectively. And with that, we will go into closed session. Thank you very much for joining us today.